All right. So I would like to welcome you all uh, to our second session uh, for economics or microeconomics, as some of you might know. So we met last uh, last week on Tuesday and we did introduction to economics, right? That's what we did last week on Tuesday. And as I highlighted, my name is James. Uh, I'm a tutor, a private tutor, uh, working with an organization called Varsity Unlimited Tutors. Uh, we are basically like a group of tutors that help students with their studies. So uh, like I highlighted uh, on Tuesday, uh, we will be doing some classes for the month of February and maybe for the first two weeks of March. And these uh, classes will be for free just for you to, to get an introduction of what you are going to learn and also for you to familiarize yourself with me and the people that will be teaching you, right? So that uh, you can make a decision if you want private tutorials. So we are private tutors, so we offer private tutorials. And this is our way of introducing ourselves to you so that you can make a decision whether you want private tutorials or you do not want private tutorials, All right? Uh, so uh, tomorrow, there will be lessons for introduction to management for the first years. There will be lessons for business finance for the second years. Then on Tuesday, I think we are going to have uh, management principles for the admin, uh, ad advanced admin students. And then I think for the first years, we should be having, I think it's digital transformation or something like that. But I'll post the links to the groups so that those that are interested can attend. But almost daily, almost each and every day for this coming week, except on Friday, almost each and every day for this coming week, except on Friday, we might have a lesson for you uh, during the night from 7 p.m. So if you want to attend, make yourself available. I'll send the link and then you can attend. So we'll just be introducing the different modules and discussing all of the different concepts of all of those different modules. All right. Then for those of you that like, oh, James, I really like the way that you guys are doing your, your private tutorials and I would want help with those private tutorials. Just a bit of more information for you is the private tutorials will start uh, uh, mid-March and uh, the, the, the tutorials will include the lessons, these lessons that we are doing, exam preparation, where we go through past exam papers, and also include help with the assignments which means that we will go through the assignments uh, or the quiz or the KCQ uh, with you guys within the class setup so that at least you can get 100% on your assignments without any problems. So that's part of the package that we give to what to the students that we are uh, that we help with. Now there are different prizes depending on what you're doing. For those that are doing advanced diploma, it's 750 rand. Uh, for each module and those that are doing first year, it's 800 rand for each module. If you want more information about this, feel free to text me on WhatsApp. The number is there, mine is there at the bottom, the one that says gems. Feel free to text me, I'll provide you more information so that you can make your decision. Then if you want to make a payment, you are free to make your payment at this month end of February so that when we start in March, you would already uh, be paid up. Then you can do also installments. So that's my introduction there. I don't think there will be much. If you want to ask me questions, we can ask maybe at the end of the what? At the end of the lecture. So now I want to go into my main class for today. All right. All right, let's see. Uh, so last week uh, on Tuesday, I introduced to you guys what economics is. And we say that economics is the study of human behavior. Economics is the study of the choices that people make on a day-to-day -day basis, right? People make choices and economics is the study of how those choices are made. And we said that the reason why people make choices, the reason why people make choices is because of two things. Number one, people have unlimited ones. They want everything. Then the economy has limited resources. They have limited land, labor, entrepreneurial skills, and et cetera. So they can only produce a limited number of goods against unlimited ones by people. So there is a mismatch between the two. And that mismatch is what we called the 
economic problem. So the mismatch between unlimited ones and limited resources is the economic problem, which we highlighted is what we are going to be studying for the rest of the what for the rest of the for the rest of the semester. Now, this mismatch can be represented through diagrams. It can be represented through diagrams, and that is what we want to talk about today, right? We want to talk about representing economic theory and the economic problem through a diagram or through calculations, right? So because you will notice when we get to the exams, especially for you guys that are doing advanced diploma in business management, when we get to the exams, there will be a lot of graphs there will be a lot of uh, calculations in your exam. So you should be prepared to do the graph. You should be prepared to do the calculations. I think in about two weeks time, maybe uh, the, 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 the week after this one, I'm gonna come to the class with a, a previous, a past exam paper, and we're gonna do some of the calculations together so that you can see what I'm talking about, right? But in short, that is what I want to add. And that is what I want to discuss today, the, 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 the graphical part of economics, right? So before I go there, I want to introduce certain terms that are important. So in economics, when we are teaching economics, right, we are going to make use of assumptions. So an assumption is basically me telling you that this and this and this exist so that we can make a decision based on that. So one of the assumptions that I can make is I can say that we have a closed economy. When I say we have a closed economy in, in economics, I'm saying that South Africa does not trade or does not export or import any products from any other country. Everything that we produce, we consume within South Africa. Everything that we need, we produce it within South Africa. That's what I mean when I say a closed economy. So that's an assumption that I can make. Then another assumption that I can make is I can say South Africa produces only two products. South Africa produces only two products. It does not matter which products that I want to talk about. It's just an example. I can say South Africa produces, uh, maybe it produces wheat and it produces computers. That's an example. Or I can say South Africa produces uh, fruit and it produces medicine. That's just an example. I'm saying South Africa can produce only two products. It's an assumption to simplify everything. Because if I want to talk about everything that is produced in South Africa, there are millions and millions of products that are produced in South Africa on a day-to-day -day basis. So for me to teach economics using millions and millions of products, it will not make sense. So I will simplify economics by giving you assumptions. So that's something that you need to really take hold of, that there will be assumptions in economics for the thing to make sense. Right. So let's assume that South Africa can produce only two products. Right. South Africa is an economy. It can either produce computers or it can produce test books. Right. Physical test books. You know, those ones that are produced paper, right? So they can either produce computers or they can produce test books. Now for you to produce anything, you're going to need resources. You're going to need land. You're going to need uh, capital. You're going to need labor. You're going to need entrepreneurial skills, right? Right. You're going to need resources, right? So if I take all of the land that is in South Africa and all of the labor that is within South Africa, and all of the entrepreneurs that is within South Africa, right? And all of the capital that the country is. And I say we only want to produce test books. I am going to produce 70 million test books. I've used everything that is in South Africa. I will only be able to produce 70 million test books. So 70 million represents the maximum number of test books that I can produce using all of the resources that is in South Africa. Now, I want you to think about what I just said. So if it means that if I decide to produce 60 million, what have I done? I have not used all of my resources. Because if I use all of my resources, I can produce 70 million. So if I decide to produce 60 million, I have not used all of my resources, right? 
I want you to catch something there, right? We're going to talk about it later, right? So I've used all of my resources. I produce 70 million. But you ask yourself a question. Do we want to be an economy that only produces testables? No, we don't want that as South Africans. We also want to produce computers, right? So if I say, okay, fine. What if I only want to produce computers? I don't want any test book. Test books are outdated. I only want to produce computers. If I use all of the resources, all of the labor, all of the entrepreneurial skills, all of the capital, right? Uh, all of the land that is in South Africa, I can only produce 9 million computers. I've not produced a single test book. I can only produce 9 million computers. So this table that is in front of you is what we call a production possibility table, which shows you how many things I can produce if I use all of the resources. And there are two extremes. Extreme number one is I produce only test books and I produce 70 million. Extreme number two is I produce only computers right there at the bottom and I produce 9 million computers without any test books. But what you discover in each and every economy is you don't only produce one thing. Right now in South Africa, we produce test books, we produce computers, we produce cars, we produce medicine, we produce clothes, which means we produce a variety of different things. So because we produce a variety of different things, there is a mixture of things that is going to happen. So if I am only looking at computers and test books, I am now saying, if I use all of my resources, I can produce 69 million test books and 1 million computers. Or I can produce 60 million test books and 4 million computers. Or I can produce 8 million test, 8 million computers and 24 million test books. It's just different combinations of what I can produce if I utilize all of my resources. I want you to underline what I said, if I utilize all of my resources, right? Now, using this table, two things can happen. The first thing is I can talk about opportunity cost. That's the first thing. I'm gonna come back to that one. I can talk about opportunity cost, right? The second thing is I can present this table as a graph. That's the second thing, right? So two things, I can talk about opportunity cost. I can present this table as a graph. So let's start with presenting this table as a graph and we'll come back to opportunity cost, right? So this is an example of me presenting this table as a graph. So if you check on this table, if you go back to, to the table that I showed you, Right. Remember what I said? I said if I produce only computers, only computers, I will produce 9 million computers and zero test books. If I produce only test books, I will produce 70 million test books and zero computers. But I said in each end of the economy, there is a mix match that is going to happen. And this mix match are all of these different points that you see here. All of these different points that you see here, they represent the different combinations. So this blue line just shows you the different combinations of what I can produce. The different combinations of computers and test books that I can produce if I utilize, again, I want you to underline this word if I utilize all of my resources. So if you were to ever get a question that says, what is the production possibility frontier or what is the production possibility curve? The production possibility frontier or the production possibility curve abbreviated PPF or PPC is the line that shows you the maximum number or maximum amount or maximum combinations of the products that you can produce if you utilize all of the resources within the economy and underline the word all. Which means that as long as I am on this blue line, as long as I am on this blue line, 
I am utilizing everything that is in the economy. There is no single thing that is missing. There is no single person that is not working. There is no single piece of land that has not yet been employed. There's no single dollar of capital that is not being used. There's no single entrepreneur that is lying idle. Every resource in the economy is being used as long as I am producing on the blue line. I need that to be very, very clear, right? Because I'm going to talk about a couple of concepts now. All right. So that's the production possibility frontier or the production possibility help. It's an important thing that you need to know. It's always in your exam. All right. So now let's discuss a little bit about this production possibility frontier. Right. So on this production possibility front end, you can see I've labeled there point number A and point number B, right? At point number A, do you notice that I can produce 3 million computers and I can also produce 65 million textbooks? At point A, I can produce 3 million computers. I hope this, I hope this is very, very clear. Because if you miss me here, hey, hey, it's going to be problems for you, right? I'm saying A, this is A here. Where is the 3 million that I'm talking about here? I'm just creating a line. And where is the 65 million that I'm talking about? It's here. The middle of 60 and 70. That's what I'm talking about. That's point A. I can produce that much at point A. But if I don't like combination A and I go to combination B, let's say I prefer combination B. I want you to see that there is now a difference. At combination B, I can no longer produce 3 million computers. I am now producing 7 million computers. I am now producing 7 million computers. But for me to produce 7 million computers, what has happened? I want you to ask yourself that question. What has happened? Right. I have produced less test books because now I'm only producing 40 million test books. I was producing 65 million test books before. Now I'm producing 40 million test books. So which means that using the production possibility curve, right? I can show you two things or three things so far. Number one, I can show you an economy that is fully utilizing all of the resources. And I can show you that by the line which is in blue or green, whatever color you're seeing there. That whole line, this whole line that is shaded, that's the production possibility curve. And it shows you full utilization, right? Full utilization, F-U-L-L. -L. Full utilization of the resources is being shown by the blue line, right? Full utilization of the resources, right? Me moving from point A to point P, what have I done? I have made a choice. Remember, we said economics is about choices. I have made a choice. If I move from point A, I was producing at point A, I have moved to point B, I have made a choice. And when you make choice, there is an opportunity cost. There is an opportunity what? There is an opportunity cost. An opportunity cost is what have I forgotten? I moved from 3 million to 7 million computers. How many computers did I gain? 7 minus 3 gives you 4. So I have gained 4 million computers by moving from A to B. I have gained 4 million computers. But what have I lost? I have lost some test books. I had 65 million test books. Now I have 40 million test books. So I have lost 25 million test books. So the cost of me getting 4 million test books is the 25 million, 4 million computers, sorry, is the 25 million test books that I have lost. That opportunity cost that I can show from this graph. Right. Now I've shown it from the graph, right? I want to go back to my diagram and show it from the diagram, right? And show it from the what? From the diagram, right? So let's look at another example in the diagram. Let's look at this example. Right? 
So let's say this is my combination A, right? And, okay, sorry for that. Let me use a different color so that it's clear. And my combination B in blue. So when I was at combination A, I discussed 8 million test box and 2 million computers. But let's say I'm saying, Aish, the, the students want computers. They no longer want test box. So can we produce more test box? And I say, I would want 1 million extra test box in addition to the ones that we had. I want 1 million extra test box. What is this going to cost me? It's going to cost me Skiste 8 minus Skiste 5, which means it's going to cost me 3 million textbooks. So for me to produce 1 million extra computers, it has costed me 3 million textbooks, right? It has costed me what? 3 million textbooks. Now, I want you to also try this on your side. Let's go back. Let's go to here. We said 3 million, right? Let's choose a different one. I want you to try on your side. Let's go to and say this is combination C, right? And then this is combination D. I want to move from combination C to combination D. How many computers am I gaining from C to D? Six, seven, that's one million. Now to you guys, how many test books did I lose from C to D? It's a question to you guys. How many test books did I lose? If I move from C to D, how many test books did I lose? You can uh, put your answer in the chat or you can unmute yourself and tell me. Nine million. Nine million. Thank you for that. Right. So I have lost nine million test books. But do you see something? I've gained the same number of computers because under A to B, I gained one million computers. Under C to D, I've gained one million computers. But the cost has changed. Do you see that? The first cost was three million and I gained one million computers. The second cost is now nine million, but I have still gained one million computers. So this means that the cost changes as we go down the table, right? This brings me a concept that you need to understand, right? This concept is called the concept of increasing opportunity cost. The concept of increasing opportunity cost, right? So each and every PPC, each and every production possibility curve that I am going to draw for you guys is going to have different shapes. They are going to have different shapes. They are not all shaped the same. They are not all shaped the same. You need to understand that. They are not all shaped the same. They will have different shapes. Okay, just give me a second. Right. So we have test books on one side and we've got computers on one side and this is our what? Our P, P, F. Sometimes it's called the production possibility frontier. Sometimes it's called the production possibility curve. It's interchangeable. Whichever way you call it, it's fine. PPF or PPC, production possibility frontier or production possibility curve. So there are three shapes that you are going to see. The normal shape of a PPC is like this. This is the normal shape, right? This is the normal shape. And this shape, we call this increasing opportunity cost, which means that the opportunity cost will increase as you move along the PPC. When you move from this point and you go to this point, the opportunity cost will increase. It will increase from 3 million to 9 million to 15 million and so forth. And that is shaped uh, exactly the way you see that it is shaped, which is a concave shape, right? So if you see a shape that is concave like this, this is called an increasing opportunity cost. And this is the most normal 
production possibility curve that you will have. I'll explain why in a few minutes, but let me go through all of the shapes first, but I'll explain why, right? Second thing, the second shape that you're going to see is this one. You can see this one is completely straight. If it is completely straight like this, this means that the opportunity cost is constant. If you calculate it and it's 3 million, it's 3 million for each and every combination. When you move from A to B to C to D to whatever, it's going to be the same. So this becomes constant opportunity cost. This is not normal. But you might see it in an exam. The lecturer can give you a graph like this and say, uh, what type of opportunity cost is this? And then your response is, this is constant opportunity cost, i.e. the opportunity cost is not changing, right? So this is not normal, but you can find it, right? Then the third shape. The third shape is going to be like this. You can see it's bowed inwards. The first one was bowed outwards. This one is bowed inwards toward the origin, a convex shell, right? So this one, we call it decreasing opportunity cost. This one is decreasing opportunity cost. And again, it's not normal for you to get this shape. The most normal one is the increasing one. The straight one and this one, they are not normal, right? It's just that you guys are students. So in exams, sometimes, you know, they throw these things around just to see if you under, if you understood. But it's not normal, but it's called the decreasing opportunity cost. Then the last shape. This one, I'm going to explain it later. For now, just, just know it since we are here already. But I'm going to explain it a bit later, right? So this one. Uh, there is no graph that is like this. It should not exist. This graph, do you know what it means? It means that you have infinite land in your country. You have infinite labor in your country. You have infinite entrepreneurs. It means that you have no scarcity. There are no shortages. Everything that you want exists. That's what this graph means. That's why I'm saying it does not exist. It will never, you will never find this graph anyway. Right. But in case you get it in an exam, if you see a graph like this and they say this is a production possibility curve, your answer is it means that there is no scarcity in this specific economy. There is no scarcity in this specific economy. Every economy is scarcity. That's why I'm saying it does not exist. But if you see the graph, it means that there is no scarcity in this specific economy. You can produce whatever you want. All right. So that's fine. We are done with this stage. Let's go back to our notes. So from this north, I can, I, I, I can assure you, you have already seen what I was talking about in terms of there going to be our workings, right? You can already see that the lecturer can ask you uh, to calculate the opportunity cost, right? He can ask you, can you please calculate the opportunity cost? And he gives you a table. And then he tells you, what if I move from A to B, what will be the opportunity cost? Of that what of that specific movement. So those this is where the calculations are coming from. Where I was saying that I'm gonna come with the past exam paper and we're gonna do some calculations together so that you can what so that you can see what I was what while I was talking about. So that's the calculation side. I think for now we can set it aside. I think you 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 get the gist of what I'm talking about. Right. We'll discuss it further when we go to the past exam. The second thing that I now want to talk about, again, this is just calculations. So calculations, you can get a graph, you can get a table to do the calculations, or you can get a graph like this one, and they tell you uh, what is the opportunity cost of moving from A to B or of moving from C to uh, B to C. Again, it's the same concept. Uh, let's say if it was this graph, and they say what is the opportunity cost of moving from B to C, Right. So we're going to go to combination number B. What did we have at combination number B? We had seven mobile phones and 20 cameras, right? And then you go to C, right? How many mobile phones do we have at C? 
we've got three, and cameras, we've got 30, right? So if we move from B to C, it means that we have gained more cameras. So for us to gain 10 cameras, which is 30 minus 20, we lost four mobile phones. So the opportunity cost of 10 cameras is four mobile phones. And you guys, you know, you should, uh, you should honestly speaking, you, you should revise your maths a little bit because your lecturer can then ask you, what is the opportunity cost of one camera? The opportunity cost of 10 cameras is four mobile phones. So what is the opportunity cost of one camera? It becomes what? Four over what? Four over 10, right? So for every camera that you want, you have to lose 0, 0,4 mobile phones. It's just uh, algebra. Yeah, just calculation. It's just a calculation. It's just algebra. It's something that you just need to, to revise your, your, your metric level mathematics at this stage because you're going to do some calculations at a certain stage in time. The benefit is you guys, are, I know uh, for the advanced diploma, you're doing business finance. And then for the first stage, you're doing business math. So you will revise your, your math there, but you are going to do some calculations. So you need to be well-versed in your mathematics. Right, so I think I'm done with the calculations for now. Unless if there's a question, we can deal with it. All right, so let's go to what I wanted to go to uh, next. Um, yes, now that's what I want to talk about, right? So I said there are two things that we can do. We can calculate opportunity cost, right? We can calculate opportunity cost from the graphs or from the tables, but also we can discuss the economic problem. So that's the second thing. We can discuss the economic problem using the production possibility curve. So number one, the production possibility curve represents full utilization of resources. That's what I told you, right? Full utilization of resources. So if you are producing on the PPC, this line that I'm now highlighting with red, if you are producing on the PPC, you are fully F U L double L. You are full utilization of resources. Full utilization of resources is also called Pareto efficiency in economics. If you see a question talking about efficiency, how can we say that this economy is efficient? If they are producing on the production possibility curve, which means on this diagram they should be producing either combination A or a combination B or a combination C, or I can come over here and put a big dot over here and say combination uh, E, right? Or put another big dot over there and say combination F or pick another big dot over here and say combination Z, as long as it is on the production possibility curve, it is full utilization of resources or it's called Pareto efficiency, right? So that's point number one. If you are producing on the PPC, full utilization, Pareto efficiency. What if you are producing inside the PPC? For example, if you are producing point number D here, what is that? This is what we call in efficiency, right? The reason why we call it inefficiency is we are saying that this person is not using all of the resources, right? He is not using all of the resources. I'll explain to you in a, in a short minute. He's not using all of the resources. So let me create another point here, an easy point to explain. This new red thing here, and let's call it point E. Right. So you can see that point E is inside. So I'm saying it's inefficient. Why am I saying it's inefficient? At point E, I can produce how many goods? 18 million goods. Right? I can also produce how many services? 21 million services. But guess what? I can go from point E and go to point B. And guess what at point B? I am still producing 18 million goods, but I am now producing 27 million services. So which means I have increased the number of services that I am producing, but I have not lost one single good. 
So if that happens in economics, we say you were not efficient because any efficient economy, for you to increase production of one product, you have to lose production of the other product. That is a efficient economy. You have to have opportunity cost. If you can increase your production without facing any opportunity cost, that is inefficient. It means that your economy was not operating efficiently. In other words, this is what we are saying. I now want you to come back to, 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 to make sense now. I'm saying that in South Africa, they are, let's assume there are 65 million in people in South Africa, right? But of course, there are children that cannot go to work. So let's assume that there are 40 million people that can go to work in South Africa. Right? If all 40 million people go to work in South Africa, we can produce 18 million products, right? Goods and 27 million services. That's what we can produce, right? But if out of those 40 million people, maybe 10 million of them don't have jobs, they are sitting at home. It means that we are now reducing the number of things that can be produced because we have got a resource that is unemployed. We have a resource that is not being utilized. So inefficiency in economy can also be called unemployment, right? Inefficiency in economics can also be called unemployment. So whenever you hear about an economy that is producing within the PPC, we call it an inefficient economy because there is unemployment of resources. Typical exam question. The lecturer will ask you, is South Africa producing on the PPC, inside the PPC, or outside of the PPC? What is your answer? South Africa is producing inside the PPC. Why do I say so? Because if you go to Statistics South Africa right now, they will tell you that there is 35% unemployment in South Africa. So if there is unemployment in South Africa, it means that there are resources that are not being used. It means that we are producing at point number D. I hope I've explained myself there. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, so I've explained point D. I've explained point E. You already know these things. This is inefficient economy because they are producing inside the PPC. I've explained point A, B, and C and say that these are efficient production, right? Because we are producing on the PPC. And I also said that when we produce at point A, B, or C, we are also going to have to make a choice. Which one do we like? And when we make a choice, we are going to calculate opportunity cost. But guess what? Do you see that I've now introduced point F, which is outside the PPC there? You now have point F. So what does point F represent? What does point F represent? So point F represents what? Represents something that is impossible. Impossible. When I say impossible, I mean that it is not attainable. It is not, and we cannot produce point F. Why? Remember our definition of the PPC. We say that the PPC represents us when we use all of the resources that are in the economy, right? So if I then produce a point F, it means that I am not, I don't have the resources to produce beyond point A, B, or C. Anything beyond that point is unattainable or it's not possible using the current resources that we have. If we add more resources, then maybe. But if we don't add any resources, it is not possible for us to talk about point number F. Right. Wonderful. Are there any questions before I go to my next, uh, because I'm going to change my gears a little bit. I'm going to change my gears a little bit. So is there any question on what we've talked about so far? Because what we're going to talk about is slightly different from this. Any questions? Anything that you did not understand? 
Um, hi, James. Yes. Is it possible for point F that in an exam they could say calculate it and they, they say they give you extra resources? Ah, uh, no. No. No, it's not possible. But the next topic that we're going to talk about is actually about point F. Don't worry. If, if your issue is on point F, don't worry. We're going to talk. The next topic is actually point F. That's what we're going to talk about. But no, you will not be asked to calculate. The only things that you may be asked to calculate is point A, B, and C. Opportunity cost from moving from point A to point B or moving from point B to point C. Those are the calculations that you can expect on the production possibility curve. You won't be asked to calculate point D, point E, point F because point D and E, it's inefficient. We're not worried about them. Point F, it's not attainable. We're not worried about it, right? So... Calculations, it will be point A, B, and C. Those are where your calculations will come from. All right. Any other questions? All right. It's fine. So now I want to talk about point F a little bit more. Right. So I said point F means something is not attainable because we don't have resources within that economy. Right. So now the question, I'm sure you guys have heard this. You have re you heard the news. I'm sure, is it last week when the sauna was being done, the president was talking about, you know, all of these different things. There is a word that I'm sure all of you know. It's called economic growth. The word economic growth. Maybe I can ask you guys, is there anyone who wants to attempt to define what is economic growth? Anyone who wants to try to attempt to define what is economic growth? Anyone who wants to attempt? You're all clueless. <laughs> all right, it's fine. All right. I'm sure you'll see economic growth from what we are now talking about. So an economy does not remain stagnant, right? An economy does not remain the same. It changes over time, right? If you go to South Africa in the year 2000, the number of cars, the number of houses, the amount of food, the amount of computers that we produced in the year 2001, and the things that we produce today, they are different. We are now producing more cars, more food, more clothes, more computers, and etc. than we were producing 20 years ago. And we call that economic growth when the output of a nation physically increases over time, right? When the output of a nation increases over time. Now, how does the output of a nation increase over time? There are two reasons why the output of a nation can increase over time. It can increase because there are more resources. Remember point F that we're talking about. It can increase because there are more resources or it can increase because there has been an improvement in technology. Now, I want you to think like a normal person, right? If you are a farmer, right? You are a farmer and you are producing six hectares of cabbages, right? If I give you an extra hectare and now you have seven hectares of cabbages, you can produce more cabbages. Just think of it, just normal. Think of it as normal as you can. Right. If in South Africa, there are 20 million people that can go to work. And then suddenly there are now 30 more. Uh, there are now 30 million people. It means that we can produce more because we have got more people to work within the economy. Right. If in South Africa, we have got a hundred thousand tractors that we can use in our farms. If next year we get 50,000 more tractors, it means that we can produce more because our capital has increased. If in South Africa, we have got two prominent entrepreneurs who are coming up with business ideas, and then we train the young people to become entrepreneurs, it means that in 10 years' time, we now have got 10,000 more entrepreneurs. We are going to produce more because we are going to have more ideas for different types of businesses. So as long as we are increasing the resources that we have, we are increasing the land, we are increasing the labor, we are increasing the entrepreneurial skills, right? We are increasing the capital. We are going to get more 
output? And how do we represent more output? We represent more output by drawing a new production possibility curve, which then now goes through point F. We are saying that there has been an increase in the output produced such that point F is now attainable because there are more resources within South Africa. Right. So this is what we what can happen with point F. Point F can suddenly become attainable because of more resources that are found within an economy. Right. I will talk about improvement in technology in a little bit, but point F can be because of more resources. All right now. So I want to give you guys an example, and I want you to think through these examples that I am giving you. All right. Uh, some examples will be bad examples, some examples will be good examples, but I want you to take them as they are. Let's assume, right, that South Africa is a dispute, right, with, um, which country can we have a dispute with? With, uh, with Namibia, like South Africa is a dispute with Namibia about some islands that are in the, in the ocean, right, in the Atlantic Ocean. And South Africa says these islands belong to us. Namibia says these islands belong to us, right? And they've been having this dispute for a while. So the islands belonged to no one. And then the International Court of Justice comes in and makes a decision and says, no, 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 these islands should belong to South Africa. They were not South Africa before because no one was using them because they were fighting over the islands. But suddenly the islands are now belonging to South Africa. What happens? To the production possibility curve of South Africa. Does it increase the output of South Africa or does it decrease the output of South Africa? What do you guys think? This is a question to you guys. What do you think? You can put your answer on the chat or you can unmute yourself. Wong, he says it increases production. That is very correct, one Because we are saying we now have extra land as a nation that we can now make use of. Now, I'm going to say something that is a little bit controversial because, you know, we are in a mixed crowd. But this is the reason why you see some countries have made more money than other countries. Because look at what we call the British Empire today. The British Empire was able to get more land by colonizing other countries. And as they were able to get more land, they were able to get what? More production, which means that their GDP, their output increased as they accumulated more land, although they lost that land at a certain point in time. But they what? They gained more land. Right. So that's example number one. Example number two, right? Let's look at uh, labor, right? South Africa, which exactly I'm trying to think of. All right, let's 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 look at uh, immigration. Right, South Africa implements a policy, right, and they say, look, hey, we want some uh, some entrepreneurs to come into South Africa, right? So they implement a policy, and they say that anyone who wants to start a business in South Africa, who wants to come and start a business in South Africa, you are allowed to come, right? Uh, you can come in with your 500,000 and you come to the South Africa and you can start your business. We'll give you the papers, right? So because of that, we see that there is a 20% increase in immigration, right, to South Africa, in immigration to South Africa, right? What happens to the production possibility of South Africa? Does it increase or does it decrease? What happens to the production possibility? Does it increase or does it decrease? Again, it's a question to you guys. You can answer it. Numfundo says increase. Wongi again says increase. That's very, very correct. So these are the type of questions that you get in your exam. Because it will just give you a scenario. He will tell you, oh, look, this has happened. So what is going to happen to production? This has happened. So what is going to happen to production? So you should be able to tell, does this increase or does this what? decrease if south africans leave south africa and go to the united uh, to the united states because there are better job opportunities in the united states it decreases production right so an increase in production 
is a movement of the production possibility curve upwards or to the right. A decrease in production is a movement of the production possibility curve inwards or to the left. I hope you caught that. Movement to the right or upwards, that's an increase in production. Movement to the left or inwards, that is a decrease in production. Right. I think I'm done with this one. Let's go to the next one. Right. So now I want to talk about technology. Right. Remember, I said that there are two reasons, growth and technology. Right. So let's talk about technology. Right. All right, don't look at the examples here, but I want to think of, you to think of something, right? So let's say that you are in the process, in the business of uh, making pizza, your debonis, right? You make pizza as debonis. And you have got this oven that you have a debonis. The oven takes you 20 minutes to bake one pizza. 20 minutes to bake one pizza. And then, you know, there is uh, some, some, some young person creates a new oven technology, heating technology, faster warmth and whatnot, all of those things, and he improves your oven. And you can now take 10 minutes to produce one pizza. So if as Dobbenes, you were producing 100,000 pizzas before, now with the new oven technology, with the new technology, you can now produce half the time. It means you can produce double using the same amount of time. So that's what we are talking about when we are talking about technology. We are saying that technology can result in faster production. Technology can result in cheaper production. Technology can result in utilization of less resources. So what happens with technology? For example, if you were producing apples as in fruit and cell phones, if I improve the technology of producing cell phones, maybe it's camera technology or a cheap technology or a plastic technology, if I improve that technology, it means that using the same amount of land, using the same amount of labor, using the same amount of capital, instead of producing 13 million cell phones, I can suddenly produce 19 million cell phones. I'm still producing the same amount of apples. Nothing has changed because my technology is for cell phones. So you will notice that instead of the whole production possibility curve changing, you are going to see it changing on only one side. And we call that a swivel, right? We call that a swivel. So allow me to draw this. So I said, you have your P, P, C, or PPF, right? Remember I said you can use that interchangeably, right? And I said if it moves downwards, we say that there are less resources. If it moves upwards, we say that there are what? There are more resources. But guess one thing. The whole thing is moving, right? The whole thing is moving. But when I start talking usually, technology can move both sides. Don't get me wrong. Technology can move things both sides. But sometimes it can move things only on one side. So I'm saying that this side remains the same. And only one side is changed. And I'm saying this is what we call a swivel of the production possibility curve. And when a production possibility curve swivels only on one side, it's because of the increases or the improvements in the utilization of technology for a particular product that you are what? That you are selling. Is the improvement in the utilization of resources of a particular product that you are what? That you are producing as an economy. Right? So it can open on either side of the, of the uh, production. Oh, yes, wonderful either side of the production possibility cap. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we spent our time wisely. This brings me to an end of the topic that I wanted to talk about today, which is the production possibility cap. The next topic that I'm going to talk about is called the secular flow of income. And after we do that secular flow of income, we will have completed an introduction to economics.
We are now going into deeper concepts of demand and supply and all of those things. So next time when we meet, we are going to do circular flow of income. And what I want us to do after the circular flow of income, uh, it's going to be next Sunday for circular flow of income. Uh, Sunday, the date is going to be 25. So on 25 February, we're going to do circular flow of income. And then after 25 February, which means the first week of March, which is three March, the evening of three March, we are going to do revision. The evening of three March, we are going to do revision of the units that we've done so far, which means I'm gonna come here with some questions uh, and we are going to go through the questions together as a team. So we are going to do revision together as a what? As a team. I'm hoping on the 3rd of March. If we don't manage, then I will just see what we can what, what we can do. So our next topic is circular flow of income, right? So a uh, quick uh, issue. Are there any questions on what we learned today? So now you know the production possibility curve. Now you know the uh, economic problem. You should are ready to answer questions on those things. You are more than ready to answer questions on those things. So now we want to talk about the circular flow of income. Are there any questions on what we have covered so far? Or maybe you have a suggestion. Uh, maybe there's something that you notice that maybe is, I'm doing that is making things a little bit difficult for you. You can highlight it to me so that we can also improve on that. Are there any questions? Yes, the recording will be made available to you guys. I will send just like the last recording. I will send it to all of the groups. I will send it to all of the all of the uh, all of the groups. I'll send it to all of the groups. Any questions? If there are no questions, we shall see each other tomorrow, guys. Um, sorry, sorry, I just want to check if this is your this is your first class. No, oh, there's a class that is before this one. There's this is a second class. There's a second, the second one. Yeah. So um can I please have um, the recording of the last one? Yeah, it's in the group. The I can send one. it to the group. If you are not in the group, you can send me a, a message. I'll add you to the group. I hope you got my number. Zero seven. Uh is it WhatsApp? Is it WhatsApp group? Yeah, it's a WhatsApp group. Which group? Uh, oh, okay. I will that says economics one. When... Or a micro. Where can I send my zero seven one three thousand six three four? That's my number. You can just message me and then I'll edit for you if you're not in the group. Zero seven one three thousand six three four. Zero seven one three thousand. I didn't get the last numbers. Zero seven one three thousand six three four. Six six three four. four. Yes. Okay, thanks, Mr. Miller. All right, wonderful. Okay, so uh, tomorrow uh, for the advanced diploma guys, we are doing our second lecture for business finance. And then for the first year guys, we are doing our first lecture for introduction to business management. That is for tomorrow evening. Business finance is at eight o'clock. Then introduction to business management is at seven o'clock. Please take note of that. I'll post the links in the morning in the groups. All right, good night. Good night, everyone. Good Thank night. you. Bye. Bye. Good night.